Welcome everybody to the thrilling, exciting, wonderful Sutta class session. And the Sutta class is where we describe some of the. What are you doing? I'll chat next to me. Where we take on some of the Buddha's teachings, I read them, and the way that these are all put together it means that they are. Uh, concise, good translation, powerful. So it may challenge you, but that's the whole point of this. If I was only going to teach you what you already know, there wouldn't be much point to it. So anyway, here we go. So as usual, I said last time, we'd like to do the Namo Tassa first of all, out of respect to the Buddha. Here we go. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato alahato samma sambuddhasa. Now here we go, the three characteristics of existence. And this is, that's right, isn't it? Not to say? Okay, good. Okay, so it starts with, this is from the Ankutra, all phenomena that arise from a cause do not persist. I prefer the word persist and to say they're impermanent, because impermanence is a word which is a little bit overused and sometimes people add some of those explanations which are not really required. But to say that if something arises from a cause, it cannot persist because that cause can change. And when the cause changes, then the effect changes. All phenomena that arise from a cause are suffering. All phenomena that arise from a cause are dukkha. You think, why on earth is that? Sure, there must be some happiness. But the point is that because they're liable to change, if they are happy, that when they get worse or disappear, that's when we suffer. So whatever happiness one has for a phenomena to arise from a cause is temporary. Unfortunately, sometimes we don't notice that. And because of that, when that uh, phenomenon disappears, then we get very, very sad. Just like you know, your mother and father, your sisters, brothers, your loved ones, we know that it must eventually disappear from us. We can't have them around us forever. Unfortunately, that sometimes even good Buddhists sometimes forget such simple teachings. And that's one of the reasons why that even good Buddhists suffer. All these things arise from the cause. We have to learn how to enjoy them if you wish. Then they are there with you. But when it's time for them to go, to let them go. And all phenomena are without a permanent essence. And as you might know, the permanent essence is my preferred translation for this word atta, or a self. And interesting, the word atta in Sanskrit is called atman. And you may know that you know, the Buddha said there is no permanent essence which deserves to be called atman. And but even just about a hundred years ago, there was a New Zealand physicist who at Cambridge University split the atom. And the atom is a Greek word meaning indivisible, like a permanent essence of stuff and matter. And in Sanskrit, atma, Greek atom, there is a connection there. Atom was like the permanent essence of stuff, of material. 
and even there, good old uh, Professor Rutherford managed to split the atom to show it is not the permanent essence of stuff. Unfortunately, the Rutherford was two and a half thousand years a bit late, but the Buddha saw that even the Atma, the, the Atta, is not a permanent essence. This thing which people take to be a self or a soul. Anyway, that's a very common uh, stanza there, all phenomena. Near here they call it Dhamma. All Dhamma is Anicca, all Dhamma is suffering, all Dhamma is without a permanent essence, is Anatta. Now we go into more detail. What do you think? And the Buddha was asking his uh, audience. Does form, body, persist or disintegrate? And you may notice here that when I said persist or disintegrate, it was, is it Anicca or is it Nietzsche? And instead of actually calling it, is it impermanent or permanent? Instead, you use the same uh, word but make it a bit more interesting and precise. The body, what it's saying is, does it persist or does it just change and disappear, disintegrate? It disintegrates, Venerable Sir. Is what disintegrates suffering or happiness? Suffering, Venerable Sir. Is what disintegrates and is suffering and subject to change fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. This I am, this is a permanent essence. No venerable sir. These are the three parts of the illusion or the delusion of a self. It's a permanent essence. It can't be a permanent essence. It disintegrates, it changes, and it's suffering. Imagine if there was a permanent essence and you found out it was dukkha. That would really suck, wouldn't it? Because when you get to your permanent essence, it's suffering. It has to be peaceful, it has to be happiness. But this I am, how can you be this I am? That means that I disintegrates and is suffering. And this is mine. The purpose of saying this is mine is what you possess, you have some control over. Do you have any control over when you disintegrate and die? I think I mentioned to you that because the rains retreat we have, this is the time we all go and retreat, I did make a request to all the people who come to our monastery and follow us in Australia, please, out of kindness and compassion to the Sangha, please don't die during the three months of the retreat. Otherwise I would have to leave and go and perform your funeral rites, which is quite disturbing. Can you do that? Can you ask people, please don't die for three months? And of course, after the retreat was over, I made the announcement. There's about three or four people was, was selfish. And they didn't follow my requests and they died during the retreat. But for the others, I said, thank you so much for not dying during those three months. Now the retreat is over. You've got my permission to die. What I was doing with, I hope, was humor, was trying to teach people that you cannot control the time you're going to die. You can't control anything, that's your body. Can you control your mind? During this retreat, you know that you know that you just let go, be peaceful. Why on earth can't you do that? And be still and peaceful and bliss out. Why not? Because you can't control your mind. It's not yours. And the body's not yours either. Okay, that's the body. Okay, next page. Does experience Vedana. Again, that is a much better translation, more accurate, meaningful, precise than this thing called feeling. You're experienced by any of those six senses. Does it persist or disappear? Sometimes I have wonderful experiences and they disappear. Sometimes I have terrible experience and they last too long. But eventually they disappear. Does perception persist or change? 
you see things one way one day, you see things another way the next day. Especially like with food. Sometimes some food which I liked earlier, sometimes today I don't like. Sometimes what I didn't like, now I like. For example, uh, that uh, one of our helpers over here, who's on retreat as well, was asking me what my favorite flower was. Because I have um, hay fever, sometimes I'm allergic to some flowers. But I said my favorite flower of all is cauliflower. Cauliflower's a flower. <laughs> no, no, and they said I did think you like cauliflower. Yes, I do. Anyway, perceptions change. And will is the fourth of the uh, components of existence. Does will stay the same or come, go, and alter? It comes and goes and alters. And because of that, it is good of us, is what is always changing, suffering or happiness, suffering then was uh, is what is in constant suffering and subject to change, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is a permanent essence. No, Venerable Sir. Now I'm talking about will here. So is will yours? The Buddha is saying very clearly here, no, it's not yours. And I pause there because that challenges some of our conceptions. We believe that will belongs to us. Are you sure? It doesn't belong to you. Your will is conditioned into you. And one example of that is, you remember that when I was a student at Cambridge, I was a member of the Psychic Research Society. And every year we would get a hypnotist in to uh, do a demonstration. And every year he could manage to hypnotize one of the students to do stupid things. And that was the entertainment part of the lecture. And this particular time he got a student, he hypnotized him, and say he would sing the British national anthem in a full voice when the hypnotist touched his right earlobe. I didn't think it would work. But then he took the student out of hypnosis, he went to sit down amongst everybody else, and then the hypnotist touched his right earlobe. And this student stood up and in a loud voice started singing, God save the Queen. And all of the people in the audience, including me, were laughing our heads off. And it was just one of the funniest things I'd ever seen. And he would not stop until he finished. I thought that was just a joke. But then the hypnotist asked this young man, why did you sing the British National Anthem at that point? And this student gave a logical answer. To this student, he was convinced that singing the British National Anthem in the midst of his friends laughing their heads off at him with no real reason to sing the British National Anthem, he thought it was justified. His mind made up a reason, even though we all knew it was not his will at all, but the result of hypnosis. And that made me stop laughing feel goosebumps. How much of what you do comes from you? Is your will yours? Or is it just a conditioned phenomenon? And our consciousnesses, this is the last part of the, uh, the five candles, consciousnesses, not just consciousness, because each consciousness type is different. That's one of the great things about when I'm saying this, you will experience jhanas if you haven't. It's just a natural phenomenon. And in the jhanas, you just have pure mind experience. The other five senses are not there. And once you know what the mind is from your own experience, you can see just how our conscious flow of experience uh, appears to us. We're seeing and then we know we see.
Have we seen some more that we know we've seen? Maybe smelling, I know we smelled. Every one of those five consciousnesses, which we call the sense consciousnesses, is always followed by the mind knowing. And you can see that once you know what this mind actually is. So, uh, our consciousness is constantly changing. They're always changing from one type of consciousness to the other. Is what is always changing, suffering or happiness? It is suffering, Venerable Sir. You get a lovely conscious experience and then it disappears. And another one comes up. Is what is in constant suffering and subject to change, fit, <coughs> sorry, fit to be regarded thus. This is mine, this I am, this is a permanent essence. No venerable sir. The other day when I gave the simile of the driverless bus, that was actually showing that even these consciousnesses are not yours. They come and they go. Okay. And so that is the first part of this. We're going to go a little bit deeper uh, before we ask the questions. Because now we come to this beautiful simile of Anatta, uh, which is, um, you may have known some of these similes, but I found them really fantastic, wonderful. Suppose that this river Thames was carrying along a great load of foam. Now, the, the, uh, the original in the party says the river Ganges, but we call it the River Thames because we're right next to the River Thames here. And that is okay, it's not changing the meaning, it's just making it a bit more relevant for people. Suppose that this River Thames was carrying along a great lump of foam. A person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void hollow and empty, for what solidity could one find in a mere lump of foam? So too, whatever kind of form, body there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect and carefully investigate, and it would appear to you to be void, empty, insubstantial. For what solidity could there be in foam, in form, body and stuff? Not just body, but stuff. That's one of the nice things about being a physicist, to see that, you know, what is even like Earth made of? You know, when you look at the elements which make up the earth, what are they made of? You keep going in and in and in, and you find there's hardly anything there. There's 99.999999999, many nines, percent emptiness, vacant, void. And then there's you know, this few uh, neutrons, protons, little electrons swirling around, but they take up such a small amount of space. In fact, when you start to look at, say, a neutron or a proton, you look at them, and they're mostly empty. You look inside, what is making them up? Just a few quarks. And quarks, these are like fundamental particles. And even these, these fundamental particles, what actually are they? Can we just know their substance? The point is, as soon as you look at one, they just change into something else. And that's why the form stuff is just so hard to understand because it's constantly moving. In fact, the world, instead of saying it's made of stuff, it's much better to say it's made of forces, the interactions between what we call the stuff. And you go down to a very small level, and I like this because uh, even the quantum physicists said at a very small level, Stuff is like foam. It's a hard, it's there and it's not there. And this is one of the reasons why I like this particular uh, description from the Buddha. I don't think 
and he would even notice how accurate that was. The stuff is like foam. Anyway, suppose it were raining and big raindrops are falling. It happens in England, it rains, but I've never seen big raindrops out here. They're all small drops like drizzle. I miss the drizzle. I haven't seen that for a while. Sorry? Take it back, the drizzle, okay. It's not mine, so I can't take it back. Suppose it were raining and big raindrops are falling and a water bubble arises and, and bursts on the surface of the water. A person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it and it would appear to them to be void, hollow and momentary. For what permanence could there be with a water bubble? It's rain dripping into a, a, a body of water. So too, whatever kind of experience there is, whatever kind of experience, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, we inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to you to be void, empty, momentary. For can anything constant be found in experience? This is when you get very mindful, whatever experience you have through any of the senses, it's like a momentary, like a clock, or a bubble, a water bubble on the lake. You see it for a moment, and then it's gone. All right, please excuse me for any uh, Scots people here. Rabbi Burns, treasures are like poppies spread, and like the flower, the bloom is shed, or like the snowfall on a river. White for a moment, then gone forever. That describes experience. Suppose in the last month of the hot season, around noon, a shimmering mirage appears. A person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it, and it would appear to them to be void, hollow, and illusory. For what reality could there be in a mirage? So too, whatever kind of perception there is, you like this talk, you don't like this talk, you find it inspiring, you find it dull. Whatever kind of perception there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect and carefully investigate it and it would appear to you to be void, empty, illusory. For what reality could there be in perception? Suppose a person needing hardwood would take a chainsaw and enter a forest. In the original, they say would take an ax or take it like a handsaw. If you wanted hardwood, you would never take a, an ordinary saw, you'd take a chainsaw. It's not a bad thing to do these days because we need all the timber we, need, we can have in the forest. But anyway, we'll take a chainsaw and enter a forest. There they would see the trunk of a large banana tree, straight, fresh, without a fruit bud core. And they would cut it down at the root, cut it off at the crown, and unroll the coil. If you've ever seen a banana tree, there's no actually hardwood in there, it's just this of, uh, what would you call it, of like a fleshy stuff. And as they unroll the coil, they would not find even softwood, let alone hardwood. A person with good sight would inspect and carefully investigate it and would appear to them to be void, hollow and without a base. For what basis could there be in the trunk of a banana tree? So whatever kind of will there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect it and carefully investigate it. As you investigate them, it appears to you to be void, empty and hollow. But what underlying basis could there be 
in volition. Suppose that a magician would perform a trick at a crossroads. A person with good eyesight would inspect it, ponder it and carefully investigate it. And it would appear to them to be void, hollow and deceptive. But what truth could there be in a magical illusion? So too, whatever kind of consciousness there is, whether past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, cosmic consciousness, unconditioned consciousness, whatever consciousness, I did those last two in, that's not in the suttas, whatever type of consciousness there is, past, future or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near, you inspect it and carefully investigate it and it would appear to you to be void, empty and deceptive. But what authenticity could there be in consciousnesses? Yes, I think that I have uh, brainwashed you enough so far. So it's now a time for questions, comments and complaints. The three C's. Okay, we've got a few. Great. Here we go. I hope that this is not too stupid a question. No, there is not anything known as a stupid question. It's only stupid when you don't ask it. Why does the self have to be defined as something permanent in the first place? <clears throat> What's wrong with a temporary self? It doesn't fulfill the idea of something which is essential, the building block of human a human being, if you're always changing, what is actually changing? Or is it just something arising and then fully passes away, leaving nothing, and another thing arises? A lot of times when we think of change, we think like it was uh, like a house. And now we paint it yellow, now we paint it green, now we paint it something else. It's still that same house, there's something underneath there which is always there, whose colour changes. So this self, if you really do take this idea of a will or a consciousness to be nothing permanent, and there's nothing which is actually being changed, it's just change, one thing leads to another, and it's not something underneath all of this being changed. And that is fine. That's good. That's the idea of life being a process. Sometimes I used to say that we're talking earlier about the string of beans. Beans, sorry. We had baked beans today. So, but they're, they're gone. They're has beans. <laughs> I ate them all. So, please excuse me. That's my character. I can't afford, I can't stop saying terrible puns. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> the string of beads. And that is just like these moments of conscious awareness. But there's no string going through them. It's just one bead next to another bead next to another bead. And there's no permanent string connecting them all together. Always there. If that's how you look at uh, a self, always changing, then that's okay. That's pretty accurate. Temporary self, and it's very temporary. It's not lasting long. Pauline, may samadhi be understood as jhana? Yes, well done. Jhana is the definition of sama samadhi. Sama samadhi, like samaditi, sama sankapa, the Eightfold Path, and the correct, the appropriate samadhi. The Buddha always, I don't know, maybe a thousand times in the suttas, always defined Sama Samadhi as the four jhanas. So great. Is it possible or even common scenario that after a couple of months of experience Samadhi, 
just simply stop experiencing it and get back to doubts, isolation, confusion, withholding into anger from sense of unity, sense of positive emotional intensity, boundless compassion, sense of clarity and sense of surrender, accepting of things as they are. If so, why is that? It's very unlikely that if you have a couple of months of experiencing jhanas, that you can simply stop experiencing it. That is very unlikely. A few times though, and I'm mentioning here the experience of like Devadatta in the suttas, there he did experience the jhana, but after the jhana, and this is one of the dangers of such experiences, we can become proud and arrogant. I've got the jhanas, you haven't. My jhanas are better than your jhanas. Anything like that, you soon lose the ability to enter a jhana. And also you start uh, losing yourself to pride. You think you are the great meditator. And that's what happened to Devadatta. He wanted to take over from the Buddha. He even tried to kill the Buddha. So, but at that time, he lost the ability to enter the jhanas. It's a strange phenomenon. I have seen this many times, that when a person does uh, experience those jhanas, they can become proud. That's the danger. And if they do and start breaking precepts, having bad thoughts, they lose the ability to enter jhanas. They can't do it anymore. You do need that virtue. So, where do you stand on free will determinism? The problem as I see it with determinism that we then lack agency for ethical choices and development of wholesome qualities. Indeed, there's one little answer to that which you know, makes a lot of sense to me. There's something in mathematics called chaos theory. Usually people understand this as the simile that a butterfly flaps its wing in Tokyo and causes a storm over London. Think that such a small change can have huge um, effects later on. And that's it because it seems that the world and the future of our world is so finely balanced that even small things can have huge effects. So, free will determinism, there's no such thing as free will, there's no such thing as determinism. Reality is in between. I'm not just saying as a, a smart get out from the question, that's closer to the truth. That's why, even if you had sensors in every square millimeter of this planet Earth, you had a big program to compute how it all interacts together, you still will not be able to predict the weather. Because the weather is just too finely balanced. A small error here causes a huge difference over there. Here we go. I was brought up a Catholic. I am sorry if this question is very basic. No, no question is basic. If there is there anything that persists in an enlightened person once he or she dies, something similar to the Catholic soul? No. By now, I guess not. Well done. Thanks again for the amazing meditation lesson. I love being here. It's brilliant. And when I say brilliant, it's because there is the craving to be, the bower dhamma, which is one of the strongest of the defilements. And the idea that you're going to disappear is very challenging for many people. People will often say they like these teachings, they're very inspiring, but the thing which puts them off, you mean I work so hard and I sacrifice so much and in the end I just disappear and I can't enjoy it ever more? That's really unfair. I've done so much, can't I just have at least a few lifetimes? To enjoy the bliss of Nibbana. No. When you understand what this body and mind really is, basically you can't get out fast enough. So anyway, you understood well then, well done. And there is still a lot of monks who are looking for what I call the ultimate retirement home of the enlightened being. 
So you can find a nice place somewhere in the ground of all being or in, uh, what else might I call it, original mind or some other sort of uh, wacky concept, which has nothing to do with Buddhism. And if, find a nice place where you can live happily ever after. The old Cinderella syndrome, as I said. And to uh, fall in love, find a soulmate in life, and they ride off into the sunset happily ever after. I've never been married, but I know married life. And that doesn't work if you find your soulmate, you run off happily ever after, maybe happily after for a week or two. And then someone's got to wash the dishes and dry the, and wash the clothes and pay the bills. Life is not like that. Enlightenment is not like that. Okay. What's the best way? Is that the next one? What's the best way to contemplate non-self to see through the illusion? Meditate and get into jhanas. Contemplate. Why do we think, assume that thinking will get us into some sort of insight? Thinking is just based on your old concepts. We are trained to think one particular way. And what the jhanas do, they give you a big kick up the backside. And you're seeing things you never expected to see. You're seeing stuff which, wow, it changes the way you look at life afterwards. So a contemplation is not good enough. You need to be able to experience those jhanas. And the second thing, this as I've said this many times before, I'm not afraid of saying it. Many times people ask me, Ajahn Brahm, you talk a lot about jhanas. Can you experience jhanas, Ajahn Brahm? And I tell people, Ajahn Brahm cannot enter a jhana. I cannot enter jhana. I cannot do it. And people say, you hypocrites, you deceived us, you just terrible monk. But then I add, Ajahn Brahm cannot enter jhana. Ajahn Brahm has to disappear first to allow the jhanas to happen. Whenever there's a sense of self, you are not still enough to be able to let the jhanas happen. The jhanas can only be experienced when temporarily or more fully you let go of your sense of what you own, who you are, and what you do. So it's not just to experience these things, but you know one of the biggest causes is to let go of your identity. Next question, what is a Wibango or some continuous, eh? Not Wibanga. <laughs> Sorry? No, it's a bawanga. A bawanga. Yeah. Wibanga is the explanation of the rules of discipline in the, for monks. This is actually uh, basically one of the earliest commentaries on the Vinaya. The bawanga is something else. Some continuous energy running through the mind as in 17 mind moments. P. Oh, please. And it is that that gets disturbed through the senses. Hope this makes sense. The Buddha never mentioned the Bawanga, never once. These days it's great, you can actually go into these suttas, into the Dhamma online. And you can just type in the word Bawanga and see where it occurs when the Buddha mentioned that word. You find it didn't. It's part of the Abhidhamma, which was after the time of the Buddha. So, let's go back to the the Buddha's words. Okay, here we go. Samsara. Okay, no. no, not there. No. Okay. One who is. One who. Which one? Oh, one who. Oh, here we go. Yeah. One who seeks pleasure in a body seeks only irritation. One who seeks irritation, I say, is not free from suffering. Have you ever had a partner, you seek some pleasure in them, 
and it gets very irritating after a while, being honest. I had a good girlfriend for many years. Actually, not for many years, but it was certainly irritating. <laughs> it was. Right. Who seeks irritation, I say, is not free from suffering. Or seeking pleasure in your own body. You know, you try to be fit. You try to be lithe and handsome or beautiful. It's just such hard work. That's why I gave up years ago. It's weird, you know, honestly. When I was young, I was reasonably good looking. And no one wanted to take photographs of me. Now I'm old and fat and bald and a monk. Lots of people like taking photographs of me. I just can't understand it. <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah. One who seeks pleasure. One who seeks gratification and experiences seeks only disappointment. Experiences. Have you seen the Great Wall of China yet? You don't need to see the Great Wall of China. There's plenty of walls in London. Some are big, some are short. Just the Great Wall of China is a bit longer than most. They're all walls. Niagara Falls. Have you seen Niagara Falls? Just you don't need to see Niagara Falls. Just go into the shower, turn the shower tap on, and just see the waterfall there. It's only a difference in size. So experience. Why do people seek gratification in experiences? But one who does is only disappointed. You know, in 19, yeah, it was 1968, I went to the United States, no, 69, sorry, United States, I had some relations up in uh, the north of New York State, and they took me to see Niagara Falls. And honestly, you can check it out on YouTube or on the Wikipedia. On that year, the government had turned off Niagara Falls. They diverted the water because the water was eroding the falls and they needed to do reparations on the granite rocks there. I couldn't believe that. You could turn off Niagara Falls. Yes, they did. I was very disappointed. <laughs> So if you seek pleasure, gratification, and experiences, you only get disappointment. And uh, one who seeks disappointment, I say, is not free from suffering. One who seeks reality and perceptions seeks only illusions. I love that saying. You seek reality and perception, you only seek illusions. One who seeks for illusions, I say, is not freed from suffering. When you perceive anything, you've got so many choices. They're mostly done subconscious of what you perceive and how you perceive it. That's why so many perceptions just are illusions. And if you seek illusion, you're not free of suffering. You seek truth. You don't see what you want to see. You don't avoid what you're afraid of seeing. You see what's truly there. It's like seeing just, you know, the bliss in the jhanas is scary, but it's true. It frees you from suffering. One who seeks contentment in volition seeks only frustration. We work hard, we, we uh, hone our will, we push out anything in the way for us achieving the objects of our will. And we think that we can get contentment there. Once you get everything which you, you you strive for, you think if I will hard enough, I can get to this beautiful place where I don't need to do anything again. I have my beautiful bhikkhuni vihara or big monastery, and I don't need to do any work. I have all these wonderful people <coughs> just do all the admin work for me, do all the cooking, all the cleaning, just do all of the emails. And all I need to do is to sit there and meditate all day. If that's what you're willing, <laughs> you think that once I get there, then I'll be content. You're asking for suffering. Literally. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, we will. So you seek contempt and volition seeks only frustration. And life is frustrating, isn't it? You know, just we want to go back to Perth and just to meditate. Why not? Life is so frustrating. Anyway, 
Mm. Uh, one who seeks frustration, I say, is not free from suffering. One who seeks eternity in consciousnesses, seeks only for the affliction of more rebirth. That's life. You seek eternity in consciousnesses. You want to find some mind, some type of consciousness where you can live happily ever after, ever after, eternity. When you seek for such a place of consciousness where you can live happily ever after, all that does is get you more rebirth. You don't end rebirth. And when there's rebirth, there's suffering. One who seeks for rebirth, I say, is free from suffering. In this next passage, and I say with a bit of um, um, shame, I said, with shame, a bit of hypocritic. Now, why this laughter? <laughs> why this joy? It's in the Dhammapada. Why this laughter? Why this joy when it's ever burning, shrouded all about in gloom? Won't you look for the light? Look at this attention demanding body. I love that saying, attention demanding body. My body, I'm sometimes you lay down at night to go to sleep and it demands attention. My leg is not comfortable. My nose is itchy. My uh, bladder needs relieving. Or you're just meditating. Okay, body, what do you need? I'll get, make sure everything is done for you. And I do everything for this body and I sit down and want something more. This attention demanding body a mass of irritations, constantly needing support, prone to illness, with nothing stable or lasting. This body gets worn out, so fragile, an incubator for COVID. I'm oh, sorry, it's an incubator for disease. <laughs> when life ends in death, this disappointing body dissolves. So anyway, um, okay, good. I'll finish here. I'll go for work for the, the last of the bit. But my friend, these are the three warnings. This is powerful. Sometimes remember seeing this uh, in uh, Vajrayana Tibetan teachings. It's in there in the uh, Theravada as well. It's just a common phrase from the Buddha. But my friend, didn't you ever see a man or a woman, 80 years of age or more, frail, sickly, struggling to walk, even with a walking frame? Actually, he said, he didn't mention a walking frame in the original. This is actually how I do make some of these uh, similes a bit more interesting. With many a complaint, strength gone, with false teeth, with white hair or a wig, with wrinkled skin and blotched limbs and forgetful. Have you ever seen old people like that? Maybe you might be one. Or get into that stage. My friend, did, not, did it not occur to you, an intelligent and mature person? I too am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. Let me now do good karma when I still can by body, speech, and mind. But my friend, did you ever see a man or a woman sick, moaning, gravely ill, bedridden, and incontinent? My friend, did it not occur to you, an intelligent and mature person? I too am subject to illness. I I'm not exempt from illness. Let me now do good karma while I still can by body, speech, and mind. But, my friend, didn't you ever see among human beings a dead man or a woman in a coffin about to be cremated or buried? You know, it's amazing these days how hard it is to see a dead person. Even if you go to a funeral service and you see them in a coffin, They've already been painted up by the environment to look like they're smiling. You know, sometimes that people have these terrible accidents just when they 
like a motorbike accident and half their face gets torn off in their dying of moments. But nevertheless, the embalmers would actually get a photo of that person and will recreate the face as best they can. So in the, in the funeral service, everyone can see that. And how it always is the case, the dead body is like gray. It's white, it has got no color in it. They always make sure they inject some chemicals to make them look as if they are healthy. And they move the corners of the mouth up so it looks like that dead person is smiling. And sometimes it's the case that you, know, you go and see that person, and then you ask the undertakers, is that that real person? It doesn't look like him. Because they try and make them look nice. Grumpy people, they don't know they're always grumpy, they never smiled in their life. But in the coffin, they do. My friend, didn't it occur to you, an intelligent, mature person? I too am subject to death. I am not exempt from death. Let me now do good calm while I still can. Yeah. Oh, just, just finishing off the chapter. Okay. Samsara. Okay, okay. Oh, that wrong. Samsara. I remember going to the airport. And this actually, Ajahn Menindo told me this. He went to an airport somewhere and Samsara was a new brand of perfume. <laughs> and it was weird because he had a look at it. And they thought, oh, this man is interested. They didn't know he was a monk. So they wanted me if he wanted to have a try of samsara. <laughs> he had enough, he had enough of samsara. He didn't want to be sprayed with it. <laughs> this samsara is without a beginning. A first point is not found of beings roaming and wandering on, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. I like that point, it's without a beginning. Didn't the Big Bang start our universe? And of course, you ask any theoretical physicist, any astrophysicist now, no. Hawking radiation, one of the results of that was to prove that the Big Bang had a before to it. It's not the start of the universe. The samsara is without a beginning. First point is not found of beings roaming and wandering on, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting. I love that phrase too, addicted to wanting. Just wanting is pleasurable. It gives us something to do. It gives us hope. What do you think? Which is more? The stream of tears that you have wept as you have roamed and wandered on through your many lives weeping and wailing because of enjoying the disagreeable and not getting what you want. This or the water in all the great oceans. For a long time you've experienced grief through the death of a loved one, of a dear friend, or the loss of reputation or wealth. As you have experienced this, weeping and wailing because of enjoying despair, not getting what you want, the stream of tears that you have wept over your many births is more than the water in all the great oceans. Have you ever wondered why the water in the oceans is salty? And all the tears. That's a joke. Which do you think is more the streams of blood that you have shed when you are beheaded as you roamed and wandered on through this long course? This or the water in all the great oceans. You have always been a good person. Sometimes we've done things wrong or sometimes we were uh, accused of stuff we didn't do. For a long time you have been arrested as murderers, burglars and adulterers. And when you were beheaded, the stream of blood that you shed is greater than the water in all the oceans. For what reason? Because this samsara is without a beginning. A first point is not discerned of beings who blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting, are journeying through this round of rebirth and death. Even just one person, just one person, wandering on through their many lives, blinded by delusion and addicted to wanting, would leave behind a stack of bones, a heap of bones, 
a mass of bones as large as Mount Everest. If there was someone to collect them all, and what was collected would not perish. For what reason? Because this samsara is without beginning. For such a long time you have experienced suffering, agony and disaster, and swelled the cemeteries with your bones from your many lives. It is enough ex to experience revulsion. This is the word nibida towards all volitional formations, all will, enough to let go of the cause of more rebirth, enough to be liberated from samsara. Basically, the Buddha is saying, haven't you had enough yet? Anyway, that's it. Yeah, sure. Any more questions there? I haven't got them there, have I? Coming, okay. Matthias, Derek, or whoever. Where was the question at? In my eyes, any romantic advances are immediately perceived as big time suffering. I never had any unpleasant experience but being a celibate. Now, I had a romantic advance you know, from the Buddha. In other words, because what romance promised you, you know, peace and bliss, companionship, answers to questions, someone you can share things with. That actually came from, from these images, all these people like an Ajahn Chah. Sometimes you could ask questions from them, it's always there for you, but you never ask anything back. There's someone who gave. This restart, blessed to see the suffering even as a teenager. Thank you for the wonderful teaching and guidance. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Next question. Need to leave. Thanks and blessings and see you tomorrow. <laughs> Excellent. I'm not quite sure what you mean there, but the best thing is if you need to leave samsara, thanks and blessings, and you won't see me tomorrow if you leave <laughs> samsara. So well done. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Wonderful. Okay. What questions can come this evening if you wish? But right now it's so close to five o'clock. It's time to uh, have cessation from the internet. And we can come back later on. Thank you. Six for meditation. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. I'm out of here. <laughs>